Let me enable screen share. Okay, so we are, I just want to make sure I have caption. Hold on one second. Yeah, I got it. So we are going to work on lab four, unit four lab today. Um, so today we're going to go back and, and basically just look at some information on operating system. Um, when you are taking the CompTIA A plus core two, which a lot of people kind of, you know, they work really hard on the core one. For one, the first part of the test is working hardware, like all the device, the components. And then core two is operating system, troubleshooting a little bit on the software side. So I kind of wanted to round it off a little bit. There are weeks that we're going to work on the hardware, and then there are weeks that we're going to come back and we're going to look at the OS. Um, a lot of it is to really focus on how you're going to be able to pass some of the interview when you go through the interview process. Um, I have students right now, they are getting ready to interview for their apprenticeship positions and they always ask me like, what are they gonna ask? And I usually tell them whatever that you put on your resume, they're gonna ask. So if you put down troubleshooting or knowing how to configure some things, you're gonna have to know the step. And the more that you are more exposed to it, the more that you're gonna remember. So I wanna make sure, and we want to have alternate ways to do things too. So. In Windows, we're going to we're gonna be able to do that. So we're going to go through the lab today, and I will explain and add some of the additional information for you um, to kind of understand, like, how to look at your system information and be able to configure, okay? Because the interview might be that how do you determine what kind of processor you have, right? Um, how are you going to be able to navigate through Windows system and be able to, to do that? So once we have the lab document downloaded, um, if you logged on to the computer, and I'm trying to record this so I can upload it. I don't know if my recording was okay last night. If not, I have to re-record. But um, a, a good way for us to kind of navigate is to go through the traditional route. So Microsoft Control Panel is really a center, uh, a centralized area where we're going to be able to manage all the elements that goes into the operating system. Um, and operating system simply is a software for us to really interface with the computer, to be able to control its resources, right? Like if I wanted to know how much RAM I have or what kind of processor I have, I would utilize my operating system tools. So we're going to do that. So once we're logged on to the computer, Right, you can simply go to your Windows search bar here and you can go ahead and type in control panel. And you can do lowercase or uppercase, that doesn't matter. So you're gonna open up the application once you found control panel. So which step am I at? I'm step number two for part A. So we're gonna search control panel and then click on the app. Now, keep in mind that when you're here in this classroom using the computer, you're on as a regular user. So you don't have, you don't have higher privilege, right? You have limited privilege. We can view and we cannot edit or can reconfigure. So at RCCD, and I know some of you had my class yesterday, we looked at this also yesterday for the network side. Um, you, you're gonna see the small icon view. To change your view, the default that you're gonna see out of the box for OS is gonna be category. So what you're gonna do is you can change this to category view and this is what you normally see when you first install Windows, right? But you can always change it. I prefer category 
because it resembles settings and it is easier for me to remember to navigate. Okay, so you can, so once you open up control panel and you can search for everything on the OS. So I did step two, I search for control panel and open it. And then I'm gonna go ahead and change it to category view. Then in the third step, I'm gonna go ahead and click system and security applet. This is gonna be the main area that we are gonna be using for IT and cybersecurity. So we're gonna click here to access the applet. So anytime that you need to modify your firewall configuration on Windows, you go to system and security, category and control panel. Anytime you need to check up on Windows Defender, which is out of the box, Microsoft Windows, um, anti-malware or AV, um, you're gonna see that also in system and security. Anytime that we need to encrypt our drive, we can use BitLocker. If you're using professional version or enterprise, we would use system and security, right? So this is the area that we deal with a lot, right? But we also use other applets. And inside systems and security, so I'm at step three, I'm gonna go ahead and click the system option in that applet. So you're gonna click here, okay? So once you click it, it's gonna open this up. And you notice that on from Windows 10 and forward, or actually the later part of Windows 7, Microsoft transitioned control panel to into settings, right? Um, they trying to make it more like a mobile platform versus something that traditional like a desktop environment. So this is what you would normally see if you look at settings. But what am I looking at on Windows 11? It tells me that my device name, no longer computer name, right? It's now called device because they're trying to make it more like a mobile device. So your system name is gonna be this. Now this is important because for the PC itself, we use network environment where we would use addresses to be able to connect to the network. But traditionally in Windows system, you can also use the computer name as in using NetBIOS to be able to connect it to part as part of the network. So the way that we can identify the system as a host is through its name. What okay. if it doesn't have a name? It has to have a name. So out of the box, you it would have a default name. Yeah, so for your device specification, this is, yeah, this is where you're going. Okay. So when, when, yeah, when you see the name at the top, right, you can see that here or sometime it's here. So now, at home, if you need to change your name, right? So out of the box, if you install Windows OS, it's gonna give you a very lengthy name. It can go up to 255 characters, right? Um, now in administration for the system, a lot of the times we don't want a really lengthy name because sometimes you, if you need to use the name to identify the system, you're gonna have to type all of that, right? Um, so. Now, in security practice, I normally advise uh, security people or IT people from using location name. Um, the reason why is if you use the physical location name, it when when they're trying to breach your system, they can actually find the exact building and the room that you located in. For, so, for example, right, like most people, a lot of IT administrator, they like to say finance PC one two six, for example right? Then I would know, that, oh, it's a, a computer that belongs in the finance department, right? And possibly sometimes they even put the room number. So um, I normally try to to tell people that if when I do consulting is you, you should change it schematically for your environment, but you don't, you shouldn't put the physical location here at RCCD. You see that it shows that here, right? I can tell that it is a PSC 16 PC, right? But right beneath that, you're gonna see your processor, okay? So this whole entire chapter is really focused on processor and its speed and what it is and the core and so on. So 
what you would see is on yours, it might say I7. I have a little bit of a later tower, so or it should say I9. So when you look at this, you would see that the processor is, the model number is here, right? For Intel, normally the, the 9,000 like this, we know that it is the ninth going toward the 10th generation. So whenever that you see like 11,000, that's 11th generation, 12,000, 12th generation. So the later generation is the more recent that that processor was produced, right? And as they produce in a later date, they have updated some of the issues or they have minimized some of the bugs in the later production. And in some cases, not always, that it would be faster, right? Not necessarily true for all later generation. They are not all created equal. So we want to take a look at the benchmark speed. So whenever that you see the number here, 3.60 gigahertz, that's gonna be the speed. And the higher the number, the faster it is at benchmark performance. So if you're buying a processor, and we looked at this last time, if it is 4.3 gigahertz, right, we know that it is benchmark at four. So normally you would normally see that Intel and AMD is roughly about between three something and four. So we kind of plateau right there right now. You might get to like the higher four, like 4.8 or 4.6. But when, you, when your system is idling, like what we're using right now, or when we're doing schoolwork, it's really not at its max capacity, but if you are turbocharging for when you're gaming, then yeah, it might re reach its peak, but it's gonna run very hot, okay? So in the next part, you are going to identify the processor. So take a screenshot first, right? So once you get to that step and you're looking at your system information here, you're gonna screenshot it, you can use SNP, and then paste it onto the document. Then you are gonna write down your processor information. So if at home, if you have an AMD, it will tell you the AMD and the core architecture is different, right? So having more core is good, right? My analogy last week you heard is kind of like if the entire family has to do chore, let's say on a Saturday, if I have two people in my family, likely that I'm gonna take more time to do the, the chore that would, that a, another family with six people would do in a lesser time. So your core is really designed as working units to be able to subdivide up the processes or the tasks simultaneously to be able to accomplish something. So whenever that you're thinking, let's say that I'm, I'm, I'm playing a game, it's actually computing, right? And so if I have eight cores, those eight units are concurrently working to be able to achieve 3D, um, let's say simulation for my game compared to if I'm using a quad core, which is four, half size of that. So the quad core processor might take a little bit longer time simultaneously to be able to achieve that task compared to eight core or 12 core, or 16 core, right? So we can, Look at it like how it can subdivide up the unit of work into the core. So, and then your device ID information and your system type. So as you find the information, you can put down your answer. Now, if you don't know the core yet, that's okay, because we're gonna look at device manager shortly. So you can leave that empty or you can Google it. Doesn't You can plug in the model number and it's gonna tell you the core. Intel should list it on their website. In Windows 10, I think Windows 11, they kind of moved, they, they did away with that line of information. Windows 10, they sell, and Windows 7, they kept that information. Okay, all right. So next, um, we are gonna look at RAM. So on your system, the, the Alienware has 32 gig. And it tells you that for me, for my system up here, it tells me that 31.8 gigabyte is usable. 
That means that it already acquired like a, a small amount of the RAM that's already been used. So the rest is usable. So that means that I can run a lot of different applications. Um, so what we can do is we can, you know, maybe install apps and application require RAM temporary storage in order to give you either the interface, a lot of the, even operating system, your software requires RAM storage, hard drive storage, and also processing requirement. Now, know that when you're using Windows 10, 7, or Windows 11, about four gig already been dedicated to your OS at all times, right? So in order to have your operating system smoothly working, we have to have at least four gig of RAM. If you only have four gig, that means that all the other application is gonna be compromised. That means that it's gonna have to swap it out and use some of the hard drive space for storage. Okay. So your system information, your system name, you can see that at the top, right? Your device name or at the top here. Now you can, at home, you can rechange, you can rename your PC. So in Windows 11, it doesn't list the domain information here, right? You have to click on domain or work group to find it. Sorry, it won't take you there. Actually, you probably have to go to, let me see. Advanced system settings, because <laughs> I'm not an admin. Um, it will be under network and internet options. So I'll come back to that shortly. Give me a second. Wow. Yeah, we're we're not able to see the domain from this page, so you are going to have to go into other areas. But I'm going to just pull it up so you can put down your answer. You can find the information on the network. I think that some of you took my class yesterday, so you already saw that. Another way that you can get into that is here, I'll show you. So network and internet, and then your view your network status. Um, but I'll just do a command line so it's easy for you. And you probably know this already because you sign into your email account all the time. So the domain that you sign into, that they have you log in, right, which is your rccd.net. Okay, so I'll put down that information here. So when, when you sign into your account, your email account, um, there, so that's the parent domain is rccd.net. Right, that encompasses the staff and the faculty side and then the student side. So when you sign in, you sign into, you know, your account under student.rccd.edu. And that is a subsidiary of the rccd.net. So what that is, is that's a parent domain. So when you logged in, you log into the subdomain of this domain. So it actually authenticate back to here. So all of these systems are joined to the domain. So that way, whenever that you logged in, it's able to recognize which account you're using, okay? So in that, when that happens, when you log in, a token is actually being given to you 
by the server to validate your privilege on that system and your permissions on the storage of that system, okay? So that means that when I logged in, like mvc.edu, it's gonna bring me back to their main parent domain, bringing down all the rights that I have on my computer or on the network. And so all of these systems in this room is joined to this network, okay? And we'll talk about this joining possibly later on um, when I go through and show you how server can be um, installed in the role and be able to, to control a lot of this, okay? So we already saw that there are 32 gig of RAM um, and then we're gonna come back to the course here, okay? Yeah, when I wrote this, this was for Windows 10 and then they upgraded to Windows 11. So the steps are slightly, but you can see advanced system settings. And I think it, it will pop up this because we don't have the privilege to see this, mm -hmm. right? But if you're using your laptop or your home computer, you are going to see the advanced settings, okay? So when you get to this step right here, for step six, it tells you to click on advanced system setting links and then system on the system applet page. And then um, you are not gonna be able to see because they lock that down, right? You're not an admin for the computer, so you won't be able to see anything. You have to give them an, uh, an account and they're not gonna let you see. Let me come back to here. Okay, next step. So instead of going through this, there are many ways to get into Device Manager. I think some of you know this from yesterday's class. You can right click the Windows button, right? And then you can also go to Device Manager. It's pinned there. So instead of doing these two steps, we're going to right click Windows button and choose Device Manager. You can also search for it, of course. So I can do this and choose device manager, or I can also search for device manager. Right? And that's going to be through control panel. So it's going to pop up this. Just click OK. We're, we can only view, but we cannot change. Let me check something real quick. Hold on one second. So another way that you can access your tools is through the properties of your root drive, which is C. So what I did was another way that you can access this is through this PC, right click the C and go to properties. Here, you're gonna see tools, right? They also, um, they should have, but they disable that option. <laughs> That's okay. There are ways that you can also access your tools, but ultimately we can find that through our right-click Windows button and go to device manager. So I changed that up a little bit instead of doing these two steps, okay? So I'm gonna highlight this. So I know that I changed it. Okay, so in device manager, you're gonna see all your components that have been installed on your system, right? Anytime that if you see an exclamation point, then that means that that device driver or that device is not fully functional. It's there, but it's not fully functional, okay? 
If you see a red X next to it, that means it's been disabled. So what we're gonna do is we are going to look for our processor information, right? So here's our computer. Um, your processor is located more than halfway down. If you look, click on it, so the amount of cores that you have, you just count these up, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So I have 16 core. Yours might be a little different. Yeah, so if it's 12, then it's 12 core. So the way that the OS sees this is it's treating each core as its individual processor when it's listing it. Right? Now, if you have quad core, you're gonna see four, right? If you have dual core, you're gonna see two. So in my case up here, I have on this particular tower, I have 16, so it's 16 core. So for yours, you can count up the number of core here and you can indicate that for 5B. Any question? All right. I have something for your daughter to remind me later. Okay. Yeah, I left it in the car. Okay, so we already in the device manager. Now we're also gonna take a look at your disk. So anytime that you're troubleshooting the computer, so let's say that um, I have students that ask me all the time, even the experienced one, they would say, oh, I built my gaming system and I just install everything. And then I, I wipe everything out and I install Windows 11 or Windows 10. And now like my, my video graphic card doesn't work. And I usually tell them you can figure your driver. So this is where you would be able to configure your driver or see if your system outside of UEFI or BIOS, right? So if the OS sees it, it would be here all your components should be listed, okay? And then when you click the arrow, it's, it shows it. So we're gonna click on disk drives and it's gonna tell me that this is the, the disk that I have, which is solid state drive. How do I know? Whenever that you see the NVMe, that's the, the remember we talked about the bus, right? Everything that's connected to your motherboard is considered a pathway for data, that's the bus. So this is a type of bus or connection that the drive uses, and it tells me it's 512 gigabyte. So it is an SSD. And then I have a Western Digital here, right? So it has two disks. One, likely that the OS is sitting on the 512, and then the other is this, the WDC. Now, if you have more on your system, let's say that I have four disks, it's gonna list four. And a lot of the times it will list the model, right? And you can change some of this in your, your system configuration in BIOS or UEFI. So in our case, I have two here. Okay, so it asks you, how many disks does it have? Okay, on device manager, it shows two. Now, is this the case if I go to this PC? Well, it shows my C drive, which is my root, but here logical partition is a little different. So think of a disk as like a house, right? And in that house, you can configure however many rooms that you want. So whenever that we do the logical configuration, what that is is, it's just division in the drive that we choose to use for a certain purpose. So for example, if I go to your house and you might have a family room, but you consider that as a den, right? But in my house, that's a family room, okay? So on the logical configuration, what we can do is we can size it to however we want to use it, even though that room physically might be bigger, okay? So if I have 512 gigabyte, I might not use 512 gigabyte for everything. 
I might use it for multiple rooms, for multiple things compared to your system that you might use for other things. So logical configuration never is, partition never really, re, always doesn't always reflect the physical configuration of the drive, okay? So here you do see that there's division, there's two drives, but sometimes you might only see one because if they disable the other one. However, in device manager, it is a little bit more apparent the type of drive that you have compared to when you're using this PC, it's only looking from the logical standpoint. Okay. All right. So that's next. So we put down what type of disk is installed and you can, you can summarize that or if you want, you can screenshot that or type it out, right? The assignment is really designed for you to go back and take a look at it later. So here I have the NVMe PC400. This is the SSD and it's 512 gigabyte. And then I have a Western Digital. I think this one is a terabyte. Any question? All right, next. So once we answer the drive, we already looked at the cores for the processor and that's gonna help you answer 5B along with 10. So, you can click it to shrink it back and then click the processor down here. So count up the cores. And it should match. We couldn't see it from the system information because that kind of went away. Let me double check something. Yeah, I think for Windows 11, um, they remove some information. Outside of the advanced system settings, you can't really see it. And you can also see device manager from in here. See that? Under system. Okay. So it should be the same. So yes. And the speed is consistent, yes. So this is the rated speed. Is it always going to be that? Oh, it might be lower. Sometimes if you turbocharge it, it might be a little higher. So when they benchmark this, they test it many times before they package it and sell it to the consumer. So this is what we normally see. And when you're using your system, like I said, checking email and even typing up homework and watching video, you're at the idle speed anyway. So it's going to be roughly here or even lower. Okay, um, then we're gonna go back to device manager. We're gonna take a look at the controller. So in the old OS, like Windows 10, it's gonna call, it's called IDE ATA, ATAPI. That was from Windows 7. But on the new device manager, you are going to see storage controller. So click storage controller instead. So I'm gonna change that on our document. So as we looked last week, right, you asked me, well, how does my drive get connected to the system? When you look at the motherboard and I said, look for the LG SATA drive, or if you have the newer motherboard, you might see the M.2 or for the, N, um, for the NVMe. So it tells me that it's using the chipset. So it has a specific group of chips that's gonna handle SATA and PCI Express, we talked about the bus as PCI Express, right, for our adapter. So these, the chipset, the group of chip is really handling how the drive is communicating with the processor. And also our device, okay? Because some of the solid state drive, sometimes it uses PCIe. And then it has the Microsoft Storage Spaces controller.
And then if you want to find out more information about each of the device or the, the type of controller, you can right click and then go to properties and you can see. This is where I can see the driver information, the general information, the details and so on, okay? I spent a little bit of time talking in my Network Plus class yesterday about this, but this is more emphasizing for your class. So when you look at resources, this is kind of good to know because sometimes when you troubleshoot, so the resources information gives you the memory range. That's what you see is a group of addresses that it uses to be able to, to identify that particular type of device. The computer treats everything as address to memory, okay? So whenever that you have a device, when it needs that device attention, it uses that address as a reference for that device. It's kind of like most of you know how to drive or you've been to the DMV before. When you go to the DMV, right, you need, or even the post office, right, or anywhere that there's a line. So when you go and you go to the information counter, they're going to give you a number. Right, that number is yours for, for most of that day that you have to wait. And whenever the, it's your turn, that number is gonna come up and then it's gonna tell you to go to which booth so that way they can help you. And it's the same thing at stores and so on. So the system does the same thing. It has a group of addresses that it uses. So whenever that it needs to refer to that device as an identification for that device, it's gonna go to the address, it's gonna say, hey, hello, I need the hard drive or I need the adapter or this using that address, okay? And so when I teach my assembly class on low-level programming, we always look at how that is pushed onto the stack and the addresses is being referred because everything in the system is referred to as memory address, okay? So as you can see there, and then for the IO, so IO is kind of like this, right? Um, you in class, and then if you need my attention, you raise your, your hand and you, you would say, teacher, I need your attention, right? So whenever the, the hard drive needs the processor attention, it's gonna raise a flag. It's gonna say, pay attention to me, right? It generates a value in this group. You see, F09 to F97. So it's gonna raise that value. So that specific controller uses that group of values. Whenever the processor needs the attention of the device, it's going to use that, that, that particular group of value as well. It's kind of like the DMV give you that number, and it's specifically for renew driver license or registration or whatever, right? So there's a range of interrupt and for I.O. that it would use. Now, in the older OS, we were able to modify this. But, you know, the developers, they realize that when people do that, it creates problem, it creates conflict. Because for a system to be using certain things, it has to be unique to the device. So they stop allowing the, the user to go in and modify that, even as an administrator. So this is what you see. And it says no conflict. So whenever that you have conflict here is when you're going to have crash or, or, you know, halt of that particular device. And, you know, no software is perfect. So sometimes you do have that issue. Sometimes you do have memory dump and other areas, blue screen of death and so on. Okay. So that kind of gives you a little bit more information about, you know, those things. Um, so we're going to go and we already look at the controller. We're going to look at the display adapter now, right? So last week, we'll look at the adapter physically on the system. You're gonna click on the display adapter. So this is a graphic adapter that was installed on your Alienware. That's what your monitor is connected to, right? So on most gaming systems, you might see some form of video adapter. And on this one, it uses the 1080 that was really popular for its time. I think now they have what? The, the the 30 series or even higher now, right? So the NVIDIA is the brand that's highly demanded by a lot of people. But GPU can be used for other things outside of just graphic adapter, right? I mentioned to you guys that it can be used for Bitcoin mining. Uh, some people, they use it for AI or machine learning and so on. 
Now, if you look at the other ones here, right, these are equipped with the motherboard. Those are called onboard display adapter. So I do have options in whether I want to use the Intel one, right? Or the adapter that I that was installed onto the bus or the expansion bus of my, my tower. Any question? So the type, the type is the onboard. Yeah, these are the onboard ones. So basically, those are the GPU that's integrated onto the motherboard, right? Um, and then this is your your device that was installed as an expansion card. So when you open up that tower, you're gonna see that you know how we looked at the adapter that's installed on the bus. That's an, actually a card or an adapter that was expanded. Right now, on the newer, on the modern system, what you see is you don't have to disable these two. If you plug in your monitor, your OS normally just, you know, it's plug and play. So it's going to be able to identify that that port is used and it's going to refer to that particular adapter. But in the case when you're troubleshooting sometimes, uh, sometimes when it causes conflict, you have to disable the onboard in order to use the expansion, right? So I cannot use both, okay? So if I have two monitor, I'm gonna have to plug, when you look at the port in the back, it has to be in the, to the same video card, okay? I cannot plug one to the top and one on the bottom. It has to be in the same area, like two HDMI or one display port and the other is HDMI. Because if I do, I plug it into the top and the bottom, right? Likely that one on the monitor is not gonna show. Okay, so you have to use one, one adapter. It's either the onboard or the other, or the expanded, okay? And then sometime we have to disable, and you should ask me, how do you disable that, right? We can't do it here because we don't have administrator privilege, but when you right click, right, on the device, see how we, we can only view, and it says that earlier, right? You can only see property, but at home, when you right click the device, you should see there's a disable option, okay? So using this to show you is kind of like pointless because you don't see it. <laughs> but if you, you can try it on your PC at home, you can right click and then the property option should be on the bottom, but you should have enable and disable. So if you already disable, you can re-enable the device. So that's a good way to really test. And remember this, whenever that you test any kind of hardware, right? You should test it with a known good device. That means what? If my, if I'm suspecting that my display adapter is bad, how can I know that it's bad? I can disable it, uninstall it, and then install an, a good one and see if that works. Or you can test it with another tower that's good, okay? So that's how we can determine is to test it with a known good device. So that way we would know. So you have to go through and eliminate, you have to disable that option, uninstall it, add it, install the driver and see. And if it shows the exclamation point, that just means that your device is seen by the OS, but it's not able to use to the full capability by the OS. So you need to install the driver. Okay, so when you go to property, you see the driver tab here, right? If I have the privilege or the right to access it, I would be able to click update driver. But when you do this, Windows would only acquire it through its library under the DLL, okay? What you, you, what you can do is you should go and download it from NVIDIA, that's best. So you can use all the 3D capability for this particular adapter especially for the 1080 or that series with a bunch of, you know, video RAM, okay. All right, so we got the information moving forward. Um, next, we're gonna go and look at settings. So in, like I mentioned before, right, we can search for settings. And then you can go to system.
So in the system, it tells you everything about that system, very similar to your smartphone. And then if you click about, it takes you to where we saw in control panel. So Microsoft, what they did was instead of keeping two separate things, if you look at Windows 10 and 7, this was two separate things. But now what they did was they pushed control panel to give you the same information as settings. So eventually, I think they're going to get rid of control panel um, down the line. But I think this is preferred by a lot of system admins still, control panel, right? Um, even Microsoft certification refer to control panel. So, you know, I think down the line for maybe like Windows 14 or something like that, they might do away with most of it because we use everything through settings. Okay, so when you go to settings, click on system and then scroll down to about, which is at the bottom, and you would see the same information that we saw earlier. Take a screenshot. Does it match? Yes. Then we're gonna go back to settings, our little wheel. And then click back on system and you should be able to see storage. So this is another way that you can see the logical layout of your drives. Now, unlike this PC, you're going to see that it's also going to tell you, oh, well, there are certain usage on your root drive or your C drive, right? It tells me that, oh, I it uses this amount for apps, for temp files. These are swap, swap storage. So that means that, you know, every storage uses some kind of temporary storage for other things. A lot of the times your application and files, things like, you know, attachment in Microsoft Outlook that, you know, um, or things that you have temporarily downloaded and put it into trash bin, uh, other things goes into temp files. In the forensic world, we love this area because you can see a lot about whoever, whatever they're doing in temp files <laughs> and in RAM. So when you dig for stuff, right? Like browser history, temp files, that's where you go first. If they didn't delete it, and even if they delete it, we can probably find some trace of what whatever, especially image. So that's why you should always break your micro SD or burn it when you get rid of it. Okay, so we saw the storage information, right? The capacity of C, you should see that at the top, it tells you here. Remember that this is only a logical, right? Remember, so imagine that some people use their whole entire house for just two rooms, right? Your house might have four rooms or three rooms. So logical partition doesn't always reflect the physical partition, even though that house is maybe 1,200 square feet. Uh, and But it's only using, we're only dividing the root drive into maybe a half of it or a fraction of it. And then when you look at the storage, coming back here, from this view, it's only showing you two, I mean one, right? Remember we saw two earlier, but you can also click show more categories and then it gives you more details here. So on this one, it also includes like your cloud drive and you know other things. I didn't like this, I feel like you know, this is extra information that Microsoft put, but, you know, this might be useful in other areas. Um, but yeah, so if you go to storage information, so I'm going to go back here. And then if you want to see more, you have to click this link, show more categories. And so it's kind of breaking down your storage into like directories or folders. So it doesn't show the second drive like what we've seen earlier. Now, if you go to this PC on your desktop, you would see that there are volumes. So 
So you can just say one. And then the type of drives that are listed, just your C drive. And then you can say folders or categories. It actually is called here, right? Because it shows one drive. And then, you know, out of that, all of these things are used. So if you look at desktop and pictures, those are actually folders that relates to your root drive. Documents is also mail. One drive is your cloud drive that's tied to your account. So storage doesn't, storage just really, it really means in settings is places that you hold your files. It doesn't reflect the number of drives that you have. If you want to see the drive, you go to this management console or, you know, this PC or other area. Okay, then we're gonna go back to settings for the next part. So we already answered 18. Does the information match with nine? No, right? Because, the, the yeah, you can, oh. you can snip it. Okay. Um, does it match nine? It doesn't exactly give you the, the multiple drives that we saw in device manager earlier, right? It only shows you C. So it only shows you partial information. So we put partial? Yeah. I didn't like that because I think, you know, for setting storage, it's really mean where you store your data compared to device manager is actually the physical drive itself, right? That how many drives that you actually installed on the computer. Then you're gonna go back to settings. And if we go back to system, we're gonna go to display, which is the first option. Here is where we can configure multiple monitors. Some of you might have this at home when you're playing your game or doing your work. Um, And then so you can change your multiple display and so on. So let me see. I don't think that you can um, <laughs> access anything advanced. So let's try advanced display. If you click on it, oh, it does give it to you. So it tells me that I have my display one, which is the monitor, okay? And then my resolution. And the color format is RGB. So it shows you a little bit more information about the bit depth and all of that. And then if you want to change the configuration for the display adapter for this particular display, you would click on this and it will tell you more. So I can reconfigure my adapter and this is something that's extra, that's why people get the expansion or the video card is to be able to have additional configuration. So if you're buying a 4K monitor, you should use a video graphic card or a GPU and configure it well. Otherwise you're not using your money efficiently, right? Effectively, okay? So this allows you to change your mode and your property information. Of course, we have to authenticate for that. Okay, so look at the resolution. So what's the resolution? That's your, your pixel here, the size. That's pretty standard, 1920 by, so on the 4K, this is higher, right, you guys? That's gonna be 4,000 something, hence the 4K. If you're using an 8K monitor, if you have that much money to buy the monitor, it would be 8,000 something. I think a lot of our apps are able to do 4K now. I haven't seen apps that are higher than 4K. So eventually, maybe a couple years from now, we'll see a lot more of it, okay? So we talked about this frequency, 240. Is this good or bad? Good or bad? Good, yes. So the lower the number, the harder it is on your eyes. 
if you buy a cheap monitor, if you look at the refresh rate, it's normally gonna say like 60 or 80. That's why it's cheap. So how can I tell my refresh rate? You guys ever watch news or people recording a screen and you see the lines coming up and down, right? You see the horizontal line, right? Every so often it's gonna show, it's scrolling down, it's scrolling down. That's a refresh rate. But our eyes are not fast enough to really capture that. But when you when you record it on the video, the, the processor and, and the camera is fast enough to capture that on screen so you can see it. So the higher the frequency here in Hertz, the better is it is for your eyes, okay? So next time when you buy monitor, focus on this as well, along with your pixel size. So the refresh rate we saw that was 240 Hertz. And then for the color format is RGB, which stands for? Thank you. Your basic color that gives you all the other colors. <laughs> Red, green, and blue. Traditional monitor color, right? This The CRT, the big bulky one that your grandparents probably have at their house <laughs> that you do not open because you will get shocked even when it's plugged in. I don't think I have any more at my house. I'm actually a technology hoarder. When you go into my garage, you probably go back a couple of decades and you can still find it. <laughs> old printers, new printer, old computers, new computers. I like to collect them. All right. Um, so we looked at the color format and space, and then you can close that. This part is really easy. So I tried to do something where you don't have to install. I originally wrote this lab for the, the other classes when they could install stuff on here. I didn't want to run virtual machine. It takes too much. We'll do virtual machine later. So I want to use some online ones and keep in mind that it's, eh, it's okay. It's not one of those best ones, but it is written in JavaScript or you know some kind of code for online interface. So it's not at its best, okay? But I'm gonna show you some of the ones that you can use on your computer if you want to benchmark or test your processor. So what are we gonna look for when we're bench testing or stress testing? When you look at the speed, it really measure how fast it is, right? So how does it do that? And to really sum it up without all the technical information, right? It is a hash operation and it was really created for to, to process, to execute the process at a very maximum speed. So think of it like an equation that they wrote to generate values, right? Basically the computer just compute, which is calculation. Um, and I tell students that at the low level, the computer just adds and people don't believe me. Really your computer just adds. When it subtracts, it adds negative number. When it multiplies, it adds many times. When it divides, it, add, it adds negative number many times, right? So the computer only adds. And so when you're looking at hash operation, basically it's an equation that generate the hash values at a higher speed. So it's able to crank it out many, many, many times at a very fast speed, okay? So now when you're looking at threads, what that does is simultaneously, that will be the operation. It's kind of like, you know how you have, let's say I have 12 core, so that's 12 people in my family, but each person have two hands. And so they're able to do things simultaneously with their two hands, right? But imagine that the threads can be eight, like if, a person have eight hands, then they're able to do more with their eight hands, get it? So the threads is really allowing you to, at the same time, to handle the higher load, right? A person with eight hands is gonna be able to get the task done a lot faster than just two hands. So the threads here is important. So when I teach programming for Python, we do multi-threading programming, simultaneous um, execution instead of like sequential. So this is where you actually tap into what we see as threading, because if you just run a program from top down, so software-wise application definitely can use this um, to the max, like your OS. Power really indicates the how much time that it's gonna be used by one thread. 
Okay. This is kind of also a little misleading, but it's really using a percentage of power to execute using that thread. And then it talks about score points. So all the testing product that you see out there in the market, it uses some kind of points to really calculate or show you how fast or how slow your processor is, okay? And then frame per second. So your, your frame rendering on the internet or on the software is usually 60, sometimes slower. So when you test it with the first one, you you're gonna see how you know this. This is a variable that's considerable when we when we look at the benchmark as well. So some of the ones that you can use that's good. I I like CPU Z. Um, it has a lot of really good capability. You can also get the manufacturer like AMD and Intel have their own. But these are some of the ones that you would see out in the market. So you can go and find it and download it. A lot of the times they're free. Okay, so let's try this one. It's okay, not the best. <laughs> okay. Um, so what we're gonna do is, if you really wanna take it to the max, you're gonna crank this up, okay? But at some point, when you go to the maximum, so let's say that if I give it 128 thread and 100% power, likely that nothing else will work for me. Like my my Word document will not work. My other website will not work. So I normally would suggest that if you're trying to test, gradually give it, you know, more, right? To the, the capability of your processor. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to give it, so I'm only going to have you test at 64 threads and at 50% power. So come back here. Type in 64 and then go 50%. I didn't like this one because when I tested it, when I wrote the lab, um, it didn't do much for me. Except for giving you the, the frame per second. It didn't give me a good score. Um, and the speed and stuff information I got from their website. So on here, they told you how you can also look at the max load and then the testing, right? So for FPS, uh, for me, when I put in 64 threads and at 50% power, um, I'm at 240. Now, then you would say, oh, well, does it really mean that we should have more processor with more core, like maybe a hundred core and, uh, you know, double the threads for each core? Well, there is Moore's law. And then also we would actually plateau even with multi-threading and, and uh, even multi-processes, right? So if you, you know, software wise, it can only use maximum amount of memory at, at uh, you know, at a certain point. So I think it peaks about 24 core right now. Um, will that change down the line? Sure. So what, what they say is like right at about 20 to 24 core, everything else subsequent, like if you can have 32 core, it's still kind of operate about the same or even sometimes slower in simultaneous uh, processing. Okay, so check that out. So answer the question, what is your frame per second value? Did the score change? No for me. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give it, oops, I'm gonna give it a higher thread. So let's go with 100 threads instead of 128. So it's gonna tell you that this might stop whatever that you're doing. So, you know, that means that we're in the peak, right? And then we're gonna go 80%. So when you stress test, we don't do every other things with it, right? We just let it run the stress test. So here, now look, it's giving you score, see? So when you go over a certain amount of threads and power, it's going to score. But look at how slow my cursor is, right? Because it becomes la less of a priority compared to whatever that it's executing with the hash algorithm at this point. 
And then if you want, you can just stop it. But let's move our cursor and it's slowly getting there. <laughs> yeah, just to press stop is the task. No, I didn't even press start. Oh. It jumped to 128.38. It started giving me a value after a minute. So after, yeah. So I would do 120, 100 and then 80. No, that's what I put in. Yeah. Oh, it so automatically it plug it in. Yeah, it jumped up and it started. <laughs> And See how, how much their web server is able to handle all like or 40 something requests all at once. <laughs> yeah, it won't let me go down. It's, it, it, it at one Try to refresh the the, the web page mm -hmm. and then so that way it would do another get with the server and then it's going to refresh. So just mm -hmm. run it for like a minute or so. You don't have to run it that long. You're going to see the points, right? Mm -hmm. So you when you get to the higher end, of the percentage and the threads, you're going to see some of the score. OK? <laughs> yeah, just to stop is a task. A little slow. Oh, so yeah, it's doing the same thing. Once I click past 80, I don't know if you jumped it and won't let it go. Are you using the button? Yeah, that's what I did. Or type in the number. It will let me do that. Or you have to stop. One hundred. Oh. Oh yeah, yours is. And I'm gonna do a zero. That's fine. One ten is good. And then change this to like eighty. And I, I said eight zero. Not a so I did this way. Okay, that's I good. Did that's good. It. Yeah, let's run it right like that. Eighty three percent. This way. Yeah. At least it's not. I mean, <laughs> all of this. Yeah, I I think something is weird with this particular computer. Uh, <laughs> with like the pre-fill for the form. Are we okay with this? Any questions? I mean, mine is still gonna go even though I pause it, right? So at some point we can also close the page or control alt delete because it will, you have to release the processor from handling all the algorithm. Otherwise you can't do anything else. And that's the one thing about stress tests, right? I'm just gonna close the page. See if it's let, letting me. Let me shrink the page. <laughs> Should have gone to um. Okay, hey, so in order to really stop it, stop it, right? You got to close the page <laughs> or even control alt delete because it has to end that process. And, you know, you can go into um, task manager and then close out that page or just click the X a couple of times. Yeah, that's why sometimes I'm like, I don't know if I wanted them to do stress tests because, all right, so let's try another one. So that way you're exposed to different things. Um, this one, we're going to go and you can highlight, oops, control and then click. Did it open? So I'll just go. 
So we're just gonna do a benchmark. Um, you have extreme tests. So the outcome, it's gonna give you the E, whatever number, the value. So when you do a benchmark, you're gonna get a P for performance. And then the, the stress test, that's the max, right? Um, which is what we've seen in the last one, that's gonna be the S. So whenever that you look at the values here, S stands for stress, right? E is for extreme, and then P is for benchmark or performance. So what we're gonna do is we are going to go ahead and click benchmark and automatically it shows me 16 threads, right? Yeah. And it's gonna try to render this image. So what they did was they created a hash algorithm that's gonna render the image and ask, you know, it's so it's trying to do as fast as it can, the faster it is, the better performance the processor would be, right? That makes sense. So when you get the full image is when it's done. And then it's gonna give you a p-value. Okay, so here it is. And then, so I have you use the site, look at the threads. So I have 16 there. And then it shows, so once you complete, when the image is full, you're gonna see the performance value. So this is the P number here. So 39284 for me and yours might be close to that. So as you look, if you look at the top benchmark, um, you know, these are just people who submit their processor for benchmarking. And then you can also go down and look at the performance specific, okay? So after we have the value information, we're gonna go and look at the 100 to see if we're even close. Now the data here is only what's been submitted to the website. It not necessarily is statistically um, tied to Intel or any other processor. So you might have other type of processor shown here. Not, okay, yeah, that's, so it highlights this. So we're roughly about that area. So it's gonna be close to this particularly. So it's not the best performing uh, processor compared to other processor that you would see, right? Like this one or another one here. And then we can also do extreme tests or, or um, another form of tests, but when you do benchmark, so we kind of fall into the category of like the not even the mid, okay? So if you look at the information for the performance, see if you can find the value. So it highlighted this for me. So that means that it's probably close to that, but I'm not able to get, uh, let me see if I can find something closer to it. It's just blah, blah.
Yeah, so if you click the little question mark or hover your mouse over it, I guess for me, um, it will be closer to this. That's what it highlighted for me. So I don't think that it would actually tell me exactly mine would be. So if it gives you some kind of highlight and some information, you can hover your mouse. And then if it has like a question mark or whatever, you click on it. or you put your cursor on it, it's gonna pop up that little text box. And then you can see your score. My threads are actually higher than what's shown there. So roughly it's gonna be close to that. So when we look at the stress test from earlier and this, yeah, ballpark, the scores are pretty close. So we're in like the, the high 30,000. Okay. Now, so how can you determine if it's a good score or a bad score, right? Um, if you look, taking a look at the top performance one, the the score for these are that it's, you would see that it is in a lower range. Uh, compared to something that's on the lower end, it's gonna be a higher score. And also depending on the website, but that's what you normally see for the most part. So find the one that it highlights for you. So that's gonna be the closest to what you have. And then put your cursor on it and you should be able to see your score close to the number of threads that you have. Mm -hmm. It'd be kind of cool to write a program for this. Actually, I thought I did something like this for my Python class for advanced Python, but. Okay, so answer the question. What is the CPU type? It's going to say Intel, right? How many threads and with the OS? Of course, it's Windows. So. And then for number 33, what did you learn from doing this exercise? We've done, we've examined multiple ways to access system devices, right? We learned how to use device manager, control panel, system uh, settings. We also learned about how to look at processor information and then to use some of the online tools for CPU benchmarking and uh, stress testing. So why does this important, right? Um, you want to see how good your CPU would be. Even though added for the manufacturer, they would already test it. But if you are gaming with your processor, I would recommend that you would see your maximum capability for your processor. And of course, we don't wanna do homework when we're benchmarking. or doing other things. So you got to let it just free be free and then be able to do that. And you would use actual software to do that, not the online one, okay? You can use the online one, but I, I really think that if you want to be more accurate and be have the capability to test it more, is to use the actual software tool. So install those. You can look at the reviews and then and use it. In the prior lab, I think if you watched my other video for this class, you've probably seen CPU-Z, which is preferred by you know many people. Um, it's good, but this process would take about at least 30 minutes to an hour for it to do the stress test. So you can do it when you're not using your computer. And then you can look at your result to see how good your processor is. Okay. Any question? All right, so make sure for our lab for today, by Sunday, you don't have to submit it today, uh, turn in your questions and answer along with the screen capture. You can use the same document or if you have a separate one, that's fine. And then don't forget your USB when you leave today. 
but make sure we save it so that way you have it either on your OneDrive or on your USB. And then I will take attendance next if we don't have any questions. And I will be here until eight o'clock. So if you want to stick around, if you need to catch up with last week lab, um, we can. Or if you want to just take a long break and stop by your house and that's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah come back next week all right uh, i will go ahead and right. stop recording give me one second yeah i just uh, oh this one's a lot that one so